Okay, let's just dive into it. Um, last week we started um, by looking at the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom, and what it actually means, God's kingdom. And I think a key takeaway from last week is that God's kingdom has got a code. There are some expectations of those who are citizens of that kingdom in the way we conduct ourselves, in the way we speak, in the way we appear, in the way we dress. God's kingdom is unique. And I think it was um, very important to look at um, some of the rules that govern God's kingdom as we'll be looking into some of those specific things um, as we move on. But I think it's very important as well to, to mention that when we're talking about God's kingdom, there has to be a spiritual differentiation. So people see God's kingdom in us and straight away they should be able to know where we belong. Bible talked about the disciples. The first time they were called Christian was in Antioch. And that's because they looked at them and said, they look like Christ. So it's an identity thing. And this evening, we'll be exploring a specific aspect of a kingdom lifestyle. And that is consecration. An interesting topic to talk about today. And we'll be drawing lessons from one of the kingdom greats, Daniel. Daniel, I'll be mentioning Daniel a lot today. Just know it's not you. Okay? So ignore, ignore the Daniel of you. Um, so, I'll split this session into four. And the first is just to look at some context around Daniel chapter one. Because oftentimes we come to this scripture... Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself. But before then, there are things that has happened. There are behind the scenes events which we'll be looking at. We'll be unpacking those. And maybe we've considered some of these. Maybe we haven't. But I'll be taking a, a few moments just to look into some of those contexts around Daniel chapter 1, so that it makes more sense when we get to verse 8. We begin to understand that there has been antecedents, there has been a range of events that has happened from even verse 1. Okay, so the first thing to mention is that this whole raid by King Nebuchadnezzar, and if you want to find more detailed story around that, background story around that, that would be in 2 Kings chapter 24. He was such a brutal king. And the way he raided Judah, it was, it was horrible, right? He took everything, desecrated the, the, the temple, took all the silver, golds, all the vessel of honor, captured the princes, captured the young men, and scripture said he only left the poor. Such a brutal raid. And it was in this raid that Daniel was shipped to Babylon. He was a slave, of course. And he was one of those selected to undergo special training to serve the king. And I think it's very important to, to, to get that context. Now, one of those things was that Daniel had no say in some of the things that were happening. So he was clearly a slave. He was clearly optionless, right? So here he is as a slave undergoing training. And if you look at some of those qualities that were expected of him, quick question, how do you determine somebody who's good in science? Somebody who's got knowledge of X, Y, Z. So Daniel would have gone through you know, very, very strict series of training. And what I can link that to in the contemporary world would be, you know, people trying to get a job and you went through series of interviews, right? Um, I had a friend who was telling me her sister had to do three stages of interviews. So you can see all of those criteria that was expected of the people that would stand before the king. And this context are quite important because we'd understand why Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 
make sense, right? So he's gone through all of this scrutiny, all of these procedures, first interview, second interview, testing verbal aptitude, testing their skill set, testing their quantitative verbal reasoning, and all of those before he was selected. Now, the other thing to mention was that the, the, the question of how Daniel and every other person selected, the question of how they look was very, very important to the king. This was something that had political interest. So King Nebuchadnezzar wanted those who would be selected to serve him to go through those three years training, after which they stand before him as a king. Now, why is that relevant? Imagine a king giving an order to say, this is what I want you guys to eat morning, day, and night. And then Daniel, a slave boy, decides to ask for permission that his own dietary is changed. And sometimes, you know, we don't really, when we, when we look at miracles in the scripture, we don't, we don't mention this. But think about it. I think, you know, we've got medical doctors here. So, vegetables and water. How does that add up? Now, the other thing to mention is Daniel knew the stakes. The risk of non-compliance to the king's request was potential death. How do we know that? Daniel chapter 1 verse 10. Let's look at that very quickly. Can somebody read that for us, please? Daniel chapter 1 verse 10, please. Yes, please. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my, my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Thank you. So the, the, the penalty was clear. If Daniel doesn't look any good, somebody's head is going. So he was very clear of the consequences. And this might not make sense until you think about how the world actually put fear in us. And then we realize that what we've stood for for a long time begins to have a different definition in our hearts. My family came down during summer, and you know, it was quite a big, big family. <laughs> so I had to take them out of town, and I needed to, to, to hire a car, a seven-seater car. So I went to these car dealer guys and did all the paperwork. Before I left, the guy said to me, Justin, you know that if anything happens to this car, right, even if it's the minutest crash, you're going to pay unlimited excess charge, which is 2,000 pounds. Now, that is not the story. And then he said to me, that includes if the crashes are one, two, or three. So for every crash, you're paying two grand. But if you pay 15 pounds, Every day, that reduces that excess to 250. So people are smiling in the room. I'm sure you've heard this a similar story. But immediately, when he said that, I knew I was a careful driver, but I found myself getting scared. What if, what if, what if, what if? And then I said to him, you know what? Just do it, do it. I know you're after my money, but just do it. Now, think about it and scale it up 100 times. Now, that sounds bad, but it's nowhere close to what was happening with Daniel. Imagine your faith causing somebody's head and causing somebody to die. So, Daniel knew all of these consequences. He was aware of all of these implications. And he found himself... Faced with a sink or swim situation. I mean, think about it. I 
could have just eaten this, how would I cause bloodshed? But you know what? He didn't give in. And then suddenly, verse 8 appeared. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these acceptable foods. So what am I saying in essence before we move to the next phase? There were stringent conditions Daniel was faced with. Okay, these are not bread and butter thing. A brutal king giving an order and a slave boy is usurping that order. Consequences, yeah, that is fine, but I'm handing it over to God. Incredible faith. Right. So, with this background, we're just going to move on to then looking at what consecration actually means for Daniel. But before then, I've got a little exercise for each table. Just to break it up a bit, um, Zotata, if you want to show the next slide, please. So this is the first reflection point. I want us to enrich our vocabulary and glossary of words. So rather than me telling you what consecration actually means, I want, so in, in education, right? I know there are lecturers here. We call it flip learning, okay? So I'm going to flip you around. Um, and then we define this together. So I'm going to be looking for keywords. I'm going to be looking for synonyms that you think best relates to consecration. And the second question, which Bible didn't tell us, but if you do some further reading, it gives you a hint as to why Daniel referred to those delicacies as a defilement. We weren't told directly. But why? I mean, it's food. Yeah? I'm going to eat it and in the next 24 hours, it's going to go out in the white room. So why does it matter? Why is it a defilement? Okay? So consider those two. I'm going to give about six minutes for that and we'll take it from there. All right. Um... I'm just going to stop us there. Sorry, I know you're in the, in the groove of discussion. Okay. Sorry for the rude interruption. We just have to move on. So I'll start with the second one. Does any table think it was because the food was too salty or spicy? Right, okay, so nobody thought that way. What possible theory do you think? I mean, there are two schools of thoughts, Bible scholars tell us, but what do you think was the main reason why Daniel would have called that a defilement? Any table? I'm going to pick this table just because I was sitting here last week. Okay, I think it's cultural issue. Yeah, he wasn't blessed. Okay, interesting. So the food wasn't blessed. Um, any other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so he believes, what's your name? Daniel, oh, we've got two Daniels in the house. Fantastic. That Daniel will be proud. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So he thinks because it was dedicated to some foreign gods. Okay. Any other thoughts? The food was unclean. Physically or? Okay, yep. Yeah. 
yeah, okay. So maybe the food was very sophisticated and he just thought, nah, you know, I'm just going to keep it simple. Yes, finally. Okay, yeah, very similar to being offered to Ida. Okay, so, um, well, we weren't told directly, but there are two schools of thoughts. The first is what exactly everybody has said. Um, the food was offered to Babylonian idols, okay? And we know, we're not surprised because if you read the history of Nebuchadnezzar, he was very much into idol worship and the Chaldeans at the time. So that's not far from the truth. The second school of thought was perhaps the drink was a bit intoxicating and contained some alcohol and all of that, so Daniel would not have any of those. But either ways, Daniel called the food a defilement. And this is the big thing for us. And at some point, we'll be considering what this means for us in this contemporary world. The first question, I was eavesdropping, so I was kind of picking on some very exciting terminologies. So bring in your, your best food. I'll take each terminology from each table. Remember, the, the plan is to expand our vocabulary this evening of what consecration means. So I'm just going to go table by table. Um, round, yeah. I'll start with this table. What's your best keyword? Oh, my. <laughs> You said holy. Okay. Yes. Jeff's table. Obedience to God. Holy obedience to God. We can see some similarity there. Yes, this table. Pure. Hmm. Exciting. This table. Being set apart. Hmm. I use that a lot. Yes. Dedication. Dedicated. Right. Okay. And this table, set up our reserved, okay? I said choose your best food. Okay, brilliant. So, you know, holy, obedient, set apart, dedicated, and I think absolutely all of those key words would match what's is on my own script of what consecration is. So, why do we then attribute consecration to Daniel? And I've tagged that second bit, a consecrated Daniel. What does it mean? So, a consecrated life is one that's not only willing to take a ride with Jesus, but also willing to abandon their boat altogether for the master's use. And we sing hymns like, take my life, and let it be consecrated unto thee. Take my moment and my days. Those are heavy words. And we're telling God, take my intellect, take my voice, take my words. Let it not be about me. Let it all be about you. And if you, if you read Daniel chapter 2 as things progressed, you realize that Daniel kept deflecting and just pushing everything back to God, even when he interpreted the dream that the king wanted to praise and honor him, he said, no, he is the God that gave me the interpretation. So it was all about him diminishing for God to increase. That's what consecrated life looks like. Now, why would Daniel ascribe so much importance to the food he's been offered? Well, as far as the consecrated life is involved, everything matters to God. Everything. And I've listened to speakers who say things like, up until the cloth I'm going to put on. Now, I don't know if that's exaggerative, but I'm not there when God tells them. But if we look at the whole principle of consecration, it's literally... God 100%. And if God is saying, well, that cloth, I don't think I'm comfortable with you putting it on. Now, it might sound very casual, but that's how much God is interested in every aspect of our lives. 
the TVs we watch, the movies, the music. A um, couple of years ago, I was in um, a choir group, and we used to do this thing just to keep ourselves in check and to keep ourselves accountable. Because I used to tell choristers then, um, you know, I said, what we do in church, where we sing, is actually rehearsal to God. What matters to God is what we do outside the stage. So we used to keep ourselves in check and we just go through each other's music library just to see if somebody's snipping to listen to Alicia Keys and all of those sorts of things. Now, it might sound very, yeah, 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 yeah. But think about everything matters to God as far as a consecrated life is. If food can matter to Daniel, and for that reason, God was moved by that act of obedience. Food. Come on. Let's think about it. Everything, as far as a consecrated life is concerned. Now, sometimes we think these life essentials are often, you know, personal choices. We hear people say, well, that's my life. That's me. But scripture tells us, that my life is no longer my own. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life I live is not mine. So everything, it's not really personal choices. Okay? And I'm saying this because sometimes we look at the things that defile spiritually. But actually, Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 7.1. It talks about the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And I know a big, a big one is coming a couple of days. Yeah, I don't mean to step on toes. Yeah, you know, you know that event? Yeah, it's a big one for, for some people. But actually, when I read the history of that, there is nothing godly about Halloween. The history is terrifying. So you've got this community that are always attacked by evil spirits. And then they have to pull all those monstrous things to scare away those evil spirits. And then it becomes a celebration. So I'm not really sure. Well, but. The point I'm making is, it matters to God. And we can't afford to expose our kids and give a gateway for demonic attacks. As far as consecration is concerned, God is interested in all aspects. For Daniel, it was not just about dissociating himself from the food. He embarked on what I call spiritual differentiation. How can they respect the God I serve if I eat the same thing they eat? That is spiritual differentiation. So it was not just, I think the, 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 the bit we can see was that he decided not to eat it. But the intention was more, far more superior when I amount to something in Babylon, they wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't respect me. They wouldn't accord the same level of dignity because I've eaten exactly the same thing. And sometimes I think this, you know, looking at this, I realize that sometimes we can stand for God but not stand out for God. And it's often tougher to stand out for God. And this was the mistake of Peter. All through his journey, he stood for God. But when the test came, you will deny me three times. And then he realized I'm the only one on the other side of the fence. That is what standing out means. And Peter denied. Thank God for the prayers that has gone ahead of him. I've been in events. You know, I remember when I was wrapping up my doctorate and my, my supervisor, we went to this bar. He wanted kind of just to start the celebration. He called some of his colleagues and friends and some of the other PhD guys. 
and we got into this bar and everybody was taking drinks and you know, you know what those drinks looked like. I felt a bit of an outlier. I'm not sure why I felt that way, but you know, it's just, you know, it's not something I do. But then I thought, I don't drink. And everybody looked at me. You know, when you get that look and nobody says anything and you get the message, right? In essence, are you actually alive? But, you know, that might be a simplistic story. But for most of us, we've had instances where it's fine to stand for God. But when it matters to stand out for him against all odds, and that is a huge part of Daniel's consecration, that everybody was eating the same thing, defiled food. And he said, I will not eat this. What is the implications of all of this? Um, I'm just checking my time. The act of consecration is an instruction from God. And the group that said holy is absolutely spot on because that is one of the commandments. Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's a command. The second is that consecration ensures our hearts are constantly purged from sins. And if you read that text, it was about Job. Scripture says he will wake and stand in the gap, consecrate the children. Paradventure, they've defiled themselves. And the third thing is consecration grants us access to God and ensures our worship and offerings receive God's attention. You know, for many years, I've always thought God called David a man after his heart because he could play the harp and the guitar and the tambourine and he could worship God. Now, that is a very huge part of worship. But that's not the reason why. He said, I have found. There was a finding first. David, and I've anointed him. A consecrated heart. He grants us access to God. And ensures that our worship receives its attention. Consecration evidences our separation from the world and from worldly desires. Can we read 2 Corinthians 6, 17 to 18? It's one of the texts. 2 Corinthians Yeah, anybody can read if you're there, please. 6, 17 to 18. Yes, please. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Thank you very much. Those are scriptures for us to consider. Um, and that, that bleeds into the next point. Holiness is perfected through consecration. And those are the exact words we, we read from scripture. Um, consecration is a lifestyle. And we can see, um, you know, obviously there are specific rules that govern our way of life and the choices that we make. And if we look at some examples, Daniel, and I think Rachel mentioned this last week. There was a particular way he should live even before he was born. And that's one key thing about consecration. It sometimes precedes our ministry. John the Baptist can imagine eating locust beans and wild honey. Anybody know what wild honey is? I've got no clue. But that was his consecration. 
And that was the way he accorded his life all through. It is demanding, but we know God's grace is sufficient. And the final bit, and I'm just going to talk a bit here before we yeah, move on. Anointing is no substitute for consecration. And I think we have built a generation which is a dangerous thread where it's all about what people say or do, how they preach, the charisma, the enthusiasm, the firepower, how much scriptures we can quote. You know the thing about consecration? It's not written on the face. And sometimes we pay so much attention on the gifts, the miracles, you know, the prayer warriors. And the Lord searches the heart, the deep things of the heart. Remember, giving my life to Christ at a very tender age. And I won't share the consecration God gave to me. It was a painful one. And that was why when Rachel asked me to, to speak on this, you know, it brought, it brought back memories. And I look back and say, thank you, Lord, for the grace on that journey. Anointing is what God enables us to do. Consecration is our commitment to God. One of the scariest scripture has got to be Matthew chapter 7. 21 to 23. Said they will come and say in my name I did this, 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 this. But his response would be I know you not, the name owner. And then you're wondering, you're doing all of this. It was fine. You're anointed to do them, but the consecration is broken. And that's why God will turn back and say, sorry, you did that in my name. That is fine. But I know you know because your heart, not your heart now, okay? Their heart was filthy. And if you look at those scriptures, Ecclesiastes 9, 8, for example, it said, let your garment be white and let your head lack no oil. Consecration and anointing are mutually inclusive. You can have one or the other. The garment has to be white. The head should not lack oil. Go to the third beat. And yeah, I'm just going to whiz through now. I think I've got five and um, ten minutes more. Okay, so, well, I can summarize what's on that third beat. Now, I've come across people who preach hyper grace. And what does hyper grace mean? A lot of times they quote Ephesians 2 8, right? By grace, we are saved, not of our works, lest any man boast. That is fine, and that is scriptural. Nobody can come and say, I can live a holy, unrighteous life on my own. But I think sometimes there is a way we stretch the truth that is no longer the truth. And I've listened to some hyper-grace preachers, and it kind of sounds like it's taking away responsibility from us as Christians. That living a holy life and consecrated life is more like AI. Where you say, Alexa, put that light off. No, it's intentional. We are saved from works onto works. That's the order. And even though we are saved by grace, we are actually saved into works. And that is why scripture will say, I come soon. And my reward is with me to give unto every man according to their works. There is intentionality. And when preparing for this, I actually stopped the beat and I was looking at the steps Daniel took before he got to verse 8. 
And I won't go over that because I think I've talked about that. But just come with me. Well, I've put some scriptural legacies. So some, some of yours might say, resolved in his heart, determined not to. But let's look at what he did. First, he defied the king's orders. That is some nerves. That is brave. Then he sought permission to opt out. And he didn't even go to the lower echelons. He went to the chief of staff, the top, top guy. That's who he sought permission from. And then he learned about the consequences, but he didn't give in. He proposed the test run and said, well, I know you don't believe me, but let's just, let's just give God a test. For 10 days, come back and look at how we look like. Intentional. Every step of that way was intentional. And then finally, he accomplished his mission. The best time to define our convictions to God is before we face situations. And I put it here that Daniel had already proposed in his heart long time ago before there. Remember when we used to grow up as Christians, there's this thing we say to ourselves, on that gun point, if somebody points a gun at you and say, denounce Christ, will you? And I didn't realize that what we were doing there was to pump our spirit up. It felt childish. If you want to go to the next reflection point, and I think after this, uh, yeah, I'll give us room to go into our groups. So what does consecration look like for us as believers in our world today? And the second bit is in what aspect of our being, and just consider either daily routines, our works, our relationships, our family, do you think our consecration is more likely to be challenged, okay? Let's just take um, five minutes to reflect on that and we'll wrap up from there. All right, I'm going to stop us there because my time is officially up now. Um, but just keep those reflections with you and it might be a good place to start, um, obviously, with the first question, the application question, because it ties into that. Um, but I'm just going to wrap up by saying, in conclusion... Um, God is challenging us to pay individual attention to areas of recurring weaknesses um, in our lives because those might be areas where God actually demands consecration. Once upon a time, a guy came to Jesus and said, um, what can I do to inherit the kingdom? And God told him, do X, Y, Z, this, this. He said, well, I've been keeping all of those since my youth. And Jesus looked at him and said, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. And scripture says the man went away sorrowful. And that might actually be an aspect of his consecration. And he realized that now. I've said I can give everything to the Lord but not that. So God is challenging us this evening, including myself, um, to look at those recurring Areas. Sometimes we are really fantastic and great people, but it might just be, you know, some, somebody tipping us off and, you know, we just flare, say, I'm going to leave my Christianity for now. But wherever it is, we know that. And before I leave, let's just read the memory verse together. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. If we can read together, one, two, go. But Daniel proposed in his heart, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. All right, so I'm just going to release us to our groups now. We're already in our groups. And just look at those two questions. Thank you very much.